Hello, Nadia. Hi, Louise. Let's start with what's hot today. Um, Concordia, okay, was named among the best maker schools in the world by uh, Make and Use Week. So what is that exactly? So what's happening? So, um, I mean, this is really exciting, Nadia. The, the maker movement has a worldwide reach. Um, a lot of the recent maker movement, ha movement has been initiated by Maker Media, uh, Dale Doherty being the initiator of, uh, of these projects uh, in, in a sort of like a forward thinking approach to changing pedagogy radically and also to building entrepreneurship um, competencies and skills in, in, in youth so that they can start, uh, you know, getting prepared for the entry into the fourth industrial revolution and the requirements of the, the future of work. Um, so in an exercise, a joint exercise by Make and Newsweek, uh, there was a methodology with uh, five or six criteria, some of which being, you know, is there a makerspace? Is there a maker program? Is there a mentorship? Are there activities? Are there communities that are related to this. Um, so they did a, an exercise uh, and it went by nomination um, and uh, Concordia made it on the first ever list of best maker schools in the world. Um, we're very honored. Uh, you know, I feel as though it, it came a bit of as a surprise because I didn't even know we were nominated. Uh, I didn't even know that this was going to happen. So, you know, at one point I opened my usual email and you know sometimes you treat it as spam you're like oh yeah news on this news on that and then I see you know best ever uh, maker schools in the world and I click on this and I kind of go oh this is cool you know let's see who I can connect with and I start looking at you know who are these people and then I see Concordia University <laughs> made it on the list yes <laughs> fantastic um, so so we uh, th there are six uh, Canadian universities on the list Okay. Uh, three in BC, two in Ontario, one in Quebec, and Concordia being the only one in Quebec. So we're very honored, and I feel as though this is hard work. And also, you know, sometimes it's like uncharted territory. It's really messy territory. It's um, it's it, historically um, material culture in education has been, um, you know, um, sort of like alienated from from usual uh, curricula. And, and what happens is that, you know, you often end up in uh, a lot of non-concrete projects in schools, especially higher education. You know, I remember at one point I was teaching with plasticine for my doctoral students to try to build some identities in terms of research. And people were building figurines in plasticine telling me, and Louise, like, how is this a doctoral course? Like, why are you asking us to do this? And I think that a lot of the intuitions that I have about, you know, working with your hands and, you know, engaging with technologies opening the black box, trying to figure out like what's in it. Like it doesn't have to be a black box. If, if, you're, if your device has proprietary screws, we can buy the screwdrivers. It's, it's not an issue. You don't have to feel as though you are um, uh, sort of like, a, you know, just waiting for big companies to, to sell your products. There's all sorts of ways to hack things and so on and so forth. So intuitively I knew that there was something into this and the entry into a disruptive economy you know the post-pandemic society and the requirements to become more confident innovators uh, or to develop students with those 21st century skills the key skills that are really really in demand by employers but also to become better responsible careful fully fledged citizens so that was just an intuition and i've been working on this for just such a long time so having this recognition was actually really satisfying and and um, you know our name is there so you know let's let's keep keep going yeah i saw social media I was celebrating so you're the director of the innovation lab so what is this lab uh, why does it exist and you uh, can you walk us through uh, its creation how it's been evolving and how do you envision it uh, post covid so, um, I mean, the Innovation Lab is, is a playground where students can work with partners uh, and faculty members around um, ill-defined challenges that have no specific solutions. And, um, you know, it's, it's really, I invite students to come and play and, and learn to take risks. You know, in higher education, we're often afraid to take risks because we're often to fail. We, we're, we're, we're afraid to fail. Uh, so come and take risks, experiment, fail, 
testings, iterate, learn, network, build your network, build your relationships to you know, various corporations, uh, education institutions, nonprofit industry, the startup um, ecosystem, and, and come and develop key skills uh, for the 21st century. And when I talk about key skills, I talk about the traditional five innovation skills that are um, strategic thinking, uh, critical thinking, creativity, communication, and collaboration. But, you know, with my experience as research chair in maker culture, one of the things that I know that is of essence when you start to try, when you try to do something that's impossible is that you have to, um, you have to build your network. And by building your network, it's not just going out and networking, it's actually taking your place also in this ecosystem. So posting things on social media, writing stories, right? It's very often you write, a, you write a story and it's sort of like your narrative and you write yourself into being as you write your story and people start to know your character, what you're made of and people start to know you. And, you know, sometimes students tell me, you know, an employer contacted me and I didn't even know that there was a job. They were looking for me because of that project and it seemed unrelated, but in how the student told the story and showed presence on social media and in, you know, um, professional networking uh, platforms, it, it helped them build uh, presence. So, you know, I work a lot on um, showing students how to network, uh, how to prototype, how to create either concrete or theoretical prototypes um, so that ideas are not kept secret for a very long time. They are able to externalize ideas. And then, you know, when they test it very rapidly and they realize, oh, this idea failed. Well, it's not really, it's not a big issue. You haven't worked on it for two years. You worked on it for a month. You try your idea, it failed, but you can go back to the drawing table and you can, you can, you know, you can try things out. And, and the uh, eighth innovation skill that I, um, that I work around is uh, leadership. So I have, um, I have started uh, training some leaders who have had the lab as a first experience and I don't want students to come and consume lab experience. Um, I figure that if, if, if I am successful in helping students become innovators with one iteration and they want to come back in the lab, they should be able to come back as leaders. And then that means, you know, start to organize events, start to take the leadership on some of the uh, challenges, help students go through the experience. I mean, it's, it's ill-defined, it's weird, it's not, it's not common, but you know, very, student, very often students who are curious are mesmerized because they say, this is exactly what we're looking for in our education. So the Innovation Lab is non-credited, um, I know that, uh, you know, it's, it's a bold move uh, to help students become confident uh, innovators, but uh, I think we're, you know, the idea is ripe, uh, the world is ready for it. The fact also that it's, a, it's, a, it's an institutional project, so it's backed by Concordia. Uh, I work under the um, approval of experiential learning and partnerships. Uh, so it's part of the portfolio of Nadia Bouyan to uh, engage more, you know, more students into experiential learning and, and build more partnerships, which is what I do in the innovation lab. So how I envisage that post-COVID, which was part of your question. Um, so the lab uh, became the lab uh, because of COVID. Uh, before that, I was in a makerspace. You know, I was very busy as a research chair in maker culture. I was building a lot of communities. I had a lot of programs. And then when we lost access to the makerspaces, um, I started seeing that there is space for companies, um, you know, a nonprofit, um, public, parapublic organizations, the startup industry, and, and, you know, a variety of stakeholders who want to come and work with students. And we started the lab um, on Discord <laughs> rather than on any university platform. We needed a space that was porous. And, and you know, the makerspace that I had created, all the makerspaces I had created were always um, very porous membranes to organizations. And I always work with this metaphor, like a porous membrane, meaning that there are as many arrows pointing in as arrows pointing out. I loved it when my students were connected with many partners. To me, it was a failure if my students were only doing their courses and their theses and were looking for jobs and they didn't know where to look. So connecting my students to people, having my students not in my lab sitting there, but also elsewhere. Um, the makerspace also was created with the idea of multiple points of entry. So, you know, you could come in, 
through regular programming, through maker jams, through workshops, through large scale events, smaller scale events. And there's a variety of ways for people to get involved. I also had like a, a maker residency program where I was able to give access to some star makers who were able to you know, create things that were to be um, commercialized, but also to give support to students. So that was something that I had lost. And, and when I recreated uh, the innovation lab working uh, with the provost's office, I realized that it could be just more broad. I had tried it in a very micro perspective, mostly in education and, you know, education related uh, maker spaces and fab labs and, you know, open creative spaces, hacker spaces. But I figured if I was able to make the call to all four faculties and bring students in interdisciplinary groups, learn how to build a team, um, learn how to negotiate with a team, learn how to, um, to, to, uh, to create some processes so that teamwork is effective. You know, it's, it's not normal that when we give teamwork in classes, there's always a tragedy. And it's, it's always the classical tragedy. Some people are not carrying their weight. Others are you know, working with strong students because they know they'll be more successful. Others are too busy to be involved. And then, you know, the, you know, the one or two students that end up doing the work are frustrated and are like, well, that was another teamwork uh, experience that I didn't like. So the idea of the lab was to create a porous membrane similar to the makerspace where partners could come in, students could work in interdisciplinary teams. And, and we started communicating on Discord. We put all the, um, uh, the documentation on Notion, which is a free, uh, a free software. And that also allowed us to invite uh, partners, potential partners, people in the community to come and see what it is exactly that we're, we're doing. Post COVID, it will be interesting because we will need a space on campus. And, uh, you know, we will, you, there's already discussions about where this could be. Um, but I, I think that the lab would be much more uh, successful if students were not isolated in an innovation lab. True innovation would be across the campus. Um, I worked on um, an exercise uh, to do an environmental scan of the instances of innovation we have on campus. And there's so much innovation happening on the floor. It's unbelievable. Um, at one point, I had to make some decisions because, you know, I can't make a map with like 1,000 instances of innovation. So we reduced uh, to uh, instances of innovation that had to do with research or social innovation, not courses or programs or you know student projects. Which, you know, granted they are extremely innovative. But at one point, I have to ensure the perennity of the exercise that, that I'm engaging in. And, and you know, as a qualitative researcher, what I did is I looked at it and I said, okay, well, how do we organize this messiness? And the problem. Uh, with, with innovation on campus is that there's a lot of it happening, but nobody knows where it is. And it's, you know, very often, that, you know, at one point, a student was telling me, you know, it's, I just got here and I'm kind of lost. And I feel that, you know, like things are happening, but I don't know who to connect with. And I'm so happy to meet you, Anne Louise. I'm, I mean, I'm very much front facing. I'm on the street. I'm in the co-ops. I'm in, you know, everywhere. And people, you know, people know me by name, but that's because I'm available and I'm present, but it's, there is so much more happening. And, and um, you know, there's, there's labs where, you know, state of the art ideas are being developed. Like there's a lot of development in materialities at Concordia, nobody knows this. Um, so how do you get involved into this? How do you even know what's happening? So the whole idea of that map was to figure out, okay, so what are the axes or what are the flavors of innovation at Concordia? And I identified, um, so I, you know, the, the final map has 55 instances of innovation and 11 different flavors, which I called axes. Do you have a vision that you can share with us? Because it would be uh, interesting to see something so, concrete. So it's a, it's a work in progress. Uh, let me just uh, show you what that looks like. So I have it at this point in black and white. Uh, but I also have it, let me just, sorry about that, Nadia. I will have to cut this piece. Or not. <laughs> or not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So. All right. So this is a draft. I will share my screen so that you can see it. 
Okay, so this is the draft of the um, innovation map. Ideally, it will be uh, interactive, and uh, I will also have an accessible version of it so that uh, students with visual impairments can can actually have access to it. So I, I created it with the metaphor of the metro map, and you know. It's interesting because maps are mysterious to me. Um, very often metro maps are even more mysterious because there's a city that has been built above ground. And then there are connections that have been built underground. And very often, you know, when we think about connections underground, we think of rhizomatic structures like, uh, you know, uh, potatoes, for example. So there is no central entity. There are various stations and um, there are lines of communication between those stations. So one of the things is that there are some initiatives, some innovation initiatives at Concordia, I, mean, I, I like to call them instances of innovation that um, are um, intersecting between uh, the axes of innovation that we've identified. So just so I can show you a little bit the logic of the map, if you look at the big titles in bold, uh, starting from the left, you know, social transformation, future of work, digital transformation, pedagogical transformation, playing, experimenting, sustainability, technology transformation, urban transformation, artistic and cultural transformation, entrepreneurship and health transformation. Those are the 11 um, flavors of innovation, which I like to call axes, uh, which become metro lines in the map. Um, if you notice, some of them have intersections. You know, the first intersection that's obvious is the ULAB, which intersects pedagogical transformation and social transformation. There's also the art hives that intersect uh, playing and experimenting and, uh, and social transformation. Same for the technology sandbox or the center for creative reuse uh, and so on and so forth. And then some of the, uh, the lines don't yet have intersections. Those are to be developed. So the more we can get to know ourselves from within, the more we can start talking, the more I think, I suspect that, you know, some new projects at the intersection of some of the axes will, uh, will emerge. I also think that maybe more axes will, will emerge at the same time. Obviously, you know, this is not exhaustive and it's not, I'm not saying that, you know, there's nothing that has been forgotten here. I hope that I've included everyone and, you know, through the exercise of focus groups that I, um, I ran with, uh, with the VP of Experiential Learning and Partnerships, we, we did invite a lot of people, um, but they're usually, um, you know, the usual suspects and they're not the people who wish they could do innovation. They have a good idea, but, you know, they're not, they're not there yet. They're not ready yet, or maybe they don't know how to proceed. So hopefully this is an invitation for people to start wanting to, you know, show themselves on this map and say, you know, and Louise, you forgot this or you forgot that. And that would be great. I'd love to know. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's, a, it's a way to, you know, sort of show the multiple layers. So we have spaces for innovation at Concordia. We have also um, uh, tools and, and machines, equipment that we can use for innovation. And the innovation uh, lab, which is uh, illustrated in the middle, allows the development of eight innovation skills that hopefully if students come in somewhere in there, they'll be able to travel within this map uh, and, and, and reach other instances of innovation and feel as though there's unity somehow in the innovation ecosystem. So that's the story of the map so far. Okay, so yeah, you have uh, many, many instances of uh, innovation at Concordia. I want to go back when you were talking about students. So you said that students were coming from four faculties, right? So you were able to actually put them together in group challenges and they were working together. So, you, and you were able also to develop leadership uh, skills. So can you talk a bit about how your students, these students are, that are coming from all different faculties, um, they went through an experience through um, your innovation lab and then they became leaders and now they're playing the leadership role. So how does this development happen through like, you know, can you explain how this transformation happened? Because this is a huge challenge. And I think in every you know, university, we need to, to develop these leadership skills uh, within our students and it is a challenge. So, yep. Um, so, 
there's a lot of moving parts in what I do. Um, and I'm not saying that I control everything. Usually I control three or four things and I initiate 50 at the same time. So um, let me tell you about the face mask challenge. So the face mask challenge was a partnership with uh, the Institute of Recherche Robert Sauvé sur la santé et sécurité au travail and uh, the aerosol filtration lab uh, at Concordia University, which is in the engineering department. What we were trying to do was to try to de design better, more efficient face masks to help curb COVID-19. The reason why I'm talking about this particular um, challenge is also because we had several iterations, so I can tell you a little bit more about the results, but also that at one point um, I also, um, got some my tax funding for two uh, graduate students. So I have a doctoral student and a master's degree student who are working on this. Um, also that I'm not alone working on this. So we have l'Institut de Recherche Robert Sauvé, but we also have uh, Ali Baloul who works, you know, between the Institut de Recherche Robert Sauvé and the Aerosol Filtration Lab. He's the director or creator of the uh, a lot of the equipment there. Uh, and Clotilde Brochot, who's also uh, his... Um, his associate, who also uh, is a doctor of uh, engineering and and, um, and and works with Institute. So, what happens is that we have you know these face mask challenges. At first, the first iteration was like people were noticing. And the first time we put face masks, we realized we had the cheap ones. They were fogging our glasses. You know, they they're not uh, sticking properly. Some of them were more comfortable. Others were less comfortable. Um, some people were developing maskne, so a lot of acne because of the masks and so on and so forth. Um, so skin reactions, all sorts of things happening. And we were just documenting, you know, well, first of all, we're not going to see the end of COVID-19 anytime soon. It was evident in the first months of the pandemic. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people were complaining about the face masks. And still today, it's a very contentious issue. Um, so what I did is I, I, mixed, I mixed it up. And uh, I, I, I brought in some engineering students, uh, some English literature students who had a background in fashion design and fashion marketing who also was a seamstress and some students in communication who were also artists. So the, the students working together as in a student actually in, in business also who was able to talk a little bit about a you know, marketing plan for, for such things. So when students tackle the problem, they tackle one section of it and then they come up, we accompany them through the process. The first iterations was through the process of design thinking. Um, I can talk about it, about that later, but we changed the design thinking process to the systemic design uh, approach, which allow, which gave us a bit more flexibility and a bit more mindfulness for the environment and other types of uh, FOSI. So um, engineering students receive state-of-the-art training to work in the aerosol filtration lab. They receive, you know, biohazard training, uh, radioactivity training, uh, WIMAS 2015, <laughs> WIMAS 2008. They had to go through all these tests and work with uh, environment and health and safety to have access to the aerosol filtration lab. Then they receive additional training to work on these machines. So a port filter and mannequin heads with uh, probes to connect to the masks and so on and so forth. So they're, they're receiving state-of-the-art training. Some of them, you know, they were in aviation and they were saying, you know, like right now we're stressed because we're realizing that aviation is going nowhere. But then they started seeing the potentials of filtration. And if they have expertise in filtration and aviation, they can merge these things together and start, you know, being much more employable. So at the same time, there's a reflection in terms of the potentials of crossing disciplines for students and, you know, going uh, on an adventure or a foray into filtration. Uh, and then, you know, the student who is also in English literature is able to create the narratives for users. Um, the student in communications and design can, can actually, you know, create illustrations and start showing to people, here's what happens when you wear a mask. Like, why is it that when you wear a mask, they all say you protect others? Why is it that you don't protect yourself with a mask? What can you do to protect yourself with a mask? How can we work on better designs? So it was interesting because as they created their first designs and prototypes, they went to test them. The first ones were dramatically bad. <laughs> like the test results were that if you were the mask that they had created, it was actually worse than just wearing a normal blue mask that you would buy on Amazon. But as they progressed with their prototype and they understood a little bit more the process and they started digging through the data that was generated, that were generated, um, 
the English literature student said, I have no idea what this is. And then the engineering student said, oh, let me explain. So between each other, they're starting to explain what's happening. Then they were, the engineering students were prototyping um, some very advanced mass designs on uh, some, some kind of fancy software. And then the seamstress was saying, well, guys, this is not, you cannot do this with fabric. Like fabric does not behave like that. So you had a wonderful exchange of expertise and knowledge and, and students peer teaching, right? So for me to teach stats to a student, it's all abstract, but there they have data that belongs to them. They're, they need to understand it in order to improve uh, their prototypes. So to me, that's extremely fruitful. And when I, when I hear students talking like this about you know, what it is for, between the disciplines, it's not just an interdisciplinary project. It's a project or a challenge that requires many people from many disciplines because it's it's you know it's not possible to solve this if you're, you're just a seamstress or just an engineer or just a designer. You need the intersection between the disciplines, and and you know in essence, what I tell the students is that no big problem that we face in our society is you know only in a single discipline. Real problems are always intersectional, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary, and require a variety of skills, knowledge, expertise, and, and, and know-how that cannot exist only in one single person. So you need to work between disciplines. So the experience that they get in the lab is, is really fruitful in, in trying to figure that out. Um, in some cases, you can't do it online. And what we did there is we, we created some small nodes of interaction. It doesn't have to be everybody together, but I, can, I could actually uh, give access to X number of students to be in a makerspace or to be in the aerosol filtration lab. Some, student decide, some students decided to meet uh, at a student's place and they just decided to meet in the, in the backyard and you know, did some work there in the garage or in the backyard. Um, so you know, there's, the university is one thing, but the students are all over the place. Um, and, 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 you know, usually that's how it works anyway in, in the workplace. So, it, it, you know, you can all go to work in one place, but at the same time, not everybody is there at the same time. So, you know, one of the, one of the first things that I noticed is that when students were working between time zones and, you know, we have some students in China, some students in India, some students in Africa. And um, it is true that some people cannot work in, in between time zones. And, you know, for example, some people need their sleep. They just can't sleep if it's not from that time to that time. And other people live at night and they're okay with that. They can feel much more flexible. For others, it's like, if it's a few days a week that I have to do that, it's fine. They're very flexible with their schedule and they're okay with that. So I guess it's a personal choice whether or not you will accept to live at another you know, another time frame in your day. And, you know, if you think about it, it's the same thing for, you know, industry workers or night shifts. If you, I mean, if you work as a doctor or as a nurse as well, you know, you will likely work at night. Um, <laughs> it's almost impossible that you don't do the night shift, <clears throat> you know, for half of, half of your existence. So for some people, it's not possible. It, it's just too difficult. For other people, it's very feasible. So we have to respect individual uh, differences. And at the same time, when we form teams, you know, we tell people like, so you're working on a team of, you know, between, you know, 14 time zones. So are you able to deal with that? And what are the processes that we can develop to do that? It has happened twice that some students told us, you know, we, I can't deal with that. Like my family life and the way that things work, there's no way I can deal with that. But in other cases, some people even appreciated it. And all of the asks at one point is like, you know, I have this happening at that time. I have an appointment. Is it okay if we adapt? And, you know, it's just a question of figuring out uh, the workflow, you know, like, and in some cases it, went, it was interesting because the team started working very fast and I realized that there was a constant workflow. So there was a day shift in Canada and then there was a night shift in Asia. And the Canadian team was actually pushing uh, for certain things, leaving notes online for the Asian team. And then the Asian team would work, leave notes for the morning so that the Canadian team could wake up and continue. And at one point I had to turn off my notifications because you know Discord was giving me notifications like 24 hours a day. And I was like, wow, the lab is really running. <laughs> like it's never sleeping. It has become like a, a sleepless uh, lab. So it, it, it is possible. I think it's just a question of being very upfront about 
what's your availability? And, and you know, when I think about it, there's a lot of, a lot of the practices that I've uh, developed in the lab would be completely um, uh, embeddable in, in classrooms. Like if you create teamwork, there are processes you can, you can give. There are mechanisms to deal with teamwork. There are theories also that can shed light, you know, like as the, team, the teams form, all sorts of things happen. At one point, the teams storm and it's normal and I'm expecting it. But at which point I can actually, you know, in, in advance, I can prepare people. I, I can have mechanisms also so that it doesn't crash. The machine does not need to crash at all times. So you can, you can definitely prepare students uh, to deal with that. And once they go through it, they realize after the experience, oh, I've learned this and I've learned that and I've learned that. And actually I can teach it. I can explain this to others. And then, you know, they want to stay in the lab. They want to do another challenge. It's like, you're welcome to stay in the lab, but you can't keep on consuming experiences for challenges. This is not what I want you to do. I want you to become a leader. I want you to help others. I want you to build your skills. I want you to become a better communicator. What is it that you want to give? And what is it that you want to learn? And let's continue moving together. And um, that's pretty much what it is. Going back to the map, how is, because you had the Innovation Lab at the center of the whole Metro map. So how is the Innovation Lab at the heart of Concordia strategic direction? So, so first of all, Concordia is a next gen university. We, we like to brand ourselves as very forward thinking, um, young, fresh, and dynamic. And, um, you know, if you, if you look at some of the directions here, those are the nine, uh, nine directions that uh, Concordia wants to aim for uh, as a next generation university. Interestingly, here you have Alina Gutierrez, who's one of my students, who is drawing uh, in a discussion uh, around the, the next direction, directions for, uh, the nine directions for a next generation university. So teach for tomorrow. Let's look into this, right? So deliver a next generation education that's connected, transformative, and fit for the times. There is so much happening in our times. Um, what people are learning, I often say, you know, what people are learning in class is just tip of the iceberg. The rest of the teaching happens outside of class, either uh, when students get involved in research, when they get involved in uh, student associations, student activities, all sorts of universities that uh, are uh, crossover on campus. So the Innovation Lab uh, has adopted, um, I mean, uh, you know, I've implemented challenge-based learning in the Innovation Lab, which in itself uh, is a little bit similar to problem-based learning or case-based learning. Basically, the idea is that we work around challenges and we, we get students to, um, uh, get to know the problem, get to know the topic, and then start engaging and, and then start acting on it. So the, the teaching approach that I've adopted in the lab is very open, respectful, um, and how students give each feedback to each other, um, how you know we respect different ways of knowing as well, different ways of interacting, people's opinion, and how how uh, how we. Um, uh, we accompany students also through processes that are very clear. Um, you know, let's, let's not um, pretend that innovation is not messy. Innovation is super messy. It's, there's a lot of moving parts, as I said before, it's never a straight line. And for students to be able to be comfortable to take risks, they have to feel safe. So in teaching for tomorrow, um, and, and, and teaching to get students to be more innovative. There has to be a framework and there has to be a form of mentoring and accompaniment that allows respecting individual reference uh, differences, but at the same time, um, letting students uh, co-teach. Uh, get your hands dirty. A lot of the prototyping and the experiential learning uh, requires getting your hands dirty. They need to get experiences outside the classroom that deepen learning and affect change. And that's, you know, in, in trying to propose some solutions for ill-defined problems or challenges, they don't have a choice but to get, get their hands dirty. Mixing it up as well, uh, build agile structures that facilitate intellectual mixing and internal collaboration. You know, in my experience, um, when you bring disciplines together, you mix it up. You mix it up not only because of the nature of the disciplines, but also the frameworks that are adopted, the approaches that are adopted. So intellectually, there's a lot of the differences between how people are acculturated to certain, um, certain uh, disciplines. 
Um, so, you know, being bold also, which is, you know, trying to think of things that are, uh, you know, innovative, uh, uh, uncharted, um, unexplored territory. Um, and, and, and growing smartly, you know, the, to me, that's basically, you know, you want it, you want to make it very big at one point, but at one point you want to say, how big can I go until I stop being efficient at what I do? So that's why I say the innovation lab right now has three or four challenges per, um, uh, per semester. We had four challenges in the winter, three in the summer, four in the fall. Some challenges are at their second iteration as well. So some people are saying, well, come on, you know, like, can't you have more challenges? Well, at one point, um, we will definitely have more challenges. But in order for me to grow smartly with the lab and also to respect the staff in the lab, to give a good experience to the students, I absolutely have to build the processes, build the program, build the documentation. Um, get some student cohorts that will give me some feedback as well. And then we can start growing our partnerships based on past experiences. If we do everything at the same time, at one point we will drop too many pieces. Um, so embrace the city and embrace the world. So the, the lab has relationships to the city, but also to the world. We are now starting to build some uh, partnerships with uh, American companies, with uh, European companies and then and educational institutions. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of it that seems to overlap and, you know, dovetail between one uh, and another. So, you know, going beyond, for example, going the extra mile for our community members. I like to say that in the lab, we, we try as much as possible to be forward thinking and also to, to do things that will serve the community at large, will serve the partners as well, will serve the mentors. You know, we have a great uh, pool of mentors that uh, love working with us. And uh, we, we work with the mentors, we learn from the mentors, we get feedback from the mentors, students give feedback, uh, the mentors give feedback to the students. So there's a lot of communication happening. And at the same time, people who are part of the lab are really proud to have been part of uh, this experience because they feel as though they, they have experienced something special, um, which is we don't know what the recipe is yet to becoming an innovator, but we have indicators that we're able to work on and, uh, and, and bring people through this experience so that we could start finding some pathways uh, for innovation. So, you know, that's, that's how it fits within the next gen nine directions uh, that we aim for. Okay, and you talked about this is this is wonderful. You talked about mentors. So just for you know, like for people who don't know what's happening in the innovation lab, you talked about your team. Um, you accompany students. You have your old students who are becoming mentors, but you also have exterior, uh, external mentors. So who are these mentors, and how do you bring them in, and how do they interact with your students, and what is exactly their role within the challenges? Okay, so who are the mentors of the Innovation Lab? They're very often uh, partners that uh, they decide to partner with the Innovation Lab and they, they propose themselves as mentors or someone who works in their company or someone who works in a, in a similar domain. So, so the, students, um, the students each have mentors for each. Okay, so each challenge has its sets of mentors. In some cases, I realize that having too many mentors actually confuses students a little bit more. Um, so the, men, the mentors help students understand the concept, the context of their organization or the concept that they're trying to you know, move forward. They provide, uh, in some cases, contextual information and in other cases, you know, this distinct uh, subject uh, knowledge. So sometimes they're just experts of a specific domain. You know, I think of, for example, one of the challenges I had in artificial intelligence, I worked with, I worked with a firm called Data H, uh, I2A2, and uh, they're, you know, um, teaching students how to make decisions using AI uh, to make better uh, financial decisions. So, at one point, the students had uh, a lot of confusion. And I said, you know, do you guys know the basics of an algorithm, um, you know, through machine, the lens of machine learning? And then they said, no. And I said, okay, I have someone who's an expert in machine learning. I'm gonna ask him to come in and, and offer um, a workshop on the basic concepts of machine learning, just so that you can get a grasp of how a machine thinks 
how they can build not from historical knowledge necessarily, but also from uh, from inferences or from algorithms. So that specific workshop was super helpful. And they went back to that mentor several times to ask questions and to validate uh, the algorithms that they were created, but it definitely helped them uh, meet the challenge. So. You know, sometimes you have process experts and then sometimes you need a very, very specific piece of knowledge that a person can actually offer. So, you know, sometimes they help students by providing essential, essential uh, domain knowledge. And, and uh, you know, what we try to ask of mentors is that they connect with students and, you know, other, they also connect other relevant expertise that they give them time. That sometimes requires meeting people in groups, and sometimes it's face to face, like one, you know, one, uh, one on one uh, kind of uh, mentorship. Um, and we like that the mentors work with us as well, so that they give us some feedback about processes, questions they have, you know, maybe they're surprised about the fact that students don't know this or don't know that or have asked these kinds of questions or have expressed these types of concerns, and and we work. We work like a community of, um, of people who are trying to give some framing to the students so that they know that they have all the resources. So, you know, a mentor should allow students to be curious, um, should be able to foster respectful conversations, um, to, uh, to be honest as well. You know, if they think that something's not going to work, that they just don't tell the student, yeah, yeah, it's all great and not offer resistance very often. I don't know if, um, if the metaphor is, is going to work for you, but you know, you train and you try to be healthy. And if you use weights that are too light, you never develop muscles. You have to be able to do the right motions, but also give yourself enough resistance so that you will build some strength. And a mentor that just says everything is okay, everything's fine, is not really a mentor. The mentor needs to offer some form of intellectual resistance so that the students will feel as though what they are thinking is not necessarily what should be happening. But at the same time, do it in such a way where they feel respected and they're not intimidated and they're able to ask you know, any question. So there's there's no dumb question when we talk about innovation. Sometimes, you know, you think, oh, well, I'm not gonna ask that because, you know, I don't, I don't feel as though, you know, I, I can, I, I don't feel confident to ask this question. Like the mentors need to be people that the students can ask any question to and, and foster some, some form of, um, you know, kindness by being very open, very, um, very available. Um, so very often, you know, if, if mentors are available a lot, that's great. But what I ask mentors is at least to be able, available one hour a week or one hour bi-weekly so that students know we're working, but the mentor is available then and they're able to go and see the mentor at one point. Interesting, because you don't have a teacher, you don't have a professor, you don't have a, you actually have a mentor who's accompanying them whatever they need something, but it's really on them. So they are controlling their experience, they're controlling how things are working and they actually go to the mentor whenever like they need the mentor, but not when they need a mentor. Um, yeah, but not the, depending on the mentor. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on the mentor and depending on the, the particular need. Um, the innovation lab, so that I mean the staff of the innovation lab, and when I mean by staff, it's a very narrow staff. It's me and and, and my coordinator, Ariel. Um, we offer students uh, weekly uh, meetings. Usually we meet them on Tuesdays and we bring them through the process. The first iteration, we brought them to the process of design thinking. And um, now we bring them to the process of systemic design. And as we go through this, we give them short videos, short articles. Like we don't give them a lot of reading. It's more like, you know, when you get to this stage, here's a, you know, a video in uh, research in Nepal and here's what they were doing. And then we get back to, you know, on a Tuesday, the students have read the resources, they became acquainted, they have time to meet with each other outside of the lab. And then we show up online and then we ask them if they have questions, we tell them what they should be doing at this point, the kinds of framing that they will need. And usually there's like a one hour checking in and it's very pleasant. We do icebreakers, you know, sometimes like, it's like, Okay, so today, you know, say something about uh, <laughs> the last, the last thing you, the first thing you ate this morning, plus, um, you know, uh, something about your, your 
you're feeling today. So, you know, I can be like a <laughs> happy watermelon <laughs> this morning because I ate watermelon. So it's sometimes very pleasant. There's little icebreakers and makes people laugh. And then we do group check-ins. So each group is able to give an update. And then we talk about, you know, what's the challenge this week, what they should be doing. And then we open breakout rooms and we let students meet for an hour on their own. And then we're available. So students can come back to the main room, talk to us. We're available also on Discord. And uh, we're, we're pretty much on the ball when it comes to giving the students what they need so that they never have to wait for a long time. But having that time that is set every week is really important. Uh, my coordinator, Ariel, also meets students usually on Tuesdays. So they never have a whole week of non-interactions. They know that one mentor is available on Monday. They're going to meet us on the Tuesday. On the Wednesday, there's something else happening, maybe a workshop or whatever else. Ariel is going to be available on Thursday. They just can drop in and say, Ariel, you know, I, I need, I need this, an answer to this question. And they move on. So we don't spend an extensive amount of time with the students, but presence is something we offer and constancy. Constance. Yeah, it feels like you have a structured, flexible experience. Like you have some structure, but you still have all the flexibility for the students and they are in control, but they also you're there for them. So it's, it's really a mix of all these different um, things. So, okay, so going back to, um, you were talking about Concordia, uh, its strategic directions, and how the Innovation Lab was at the heart of Concordia strategic directions. How do you determine the value of an, innov an Innovation Lab inside the university? Okay, can you repeat that question? So how do you determine the value of an innovation lab inside a university? So how do you know that, like, how can you determine what are the metrics or what, how can you determine the value of the instance that you're creating? <laughs> you're laughing. I think you've been thinking about that for, I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Can I repeat the question? <laughs> I'm not sure what the answer to this, like what's the value of, a, of an innovation lab? I can tell you from the testimonials of the students and the reactions of the partners that this is very valuable because I can't um, put a number on it. Like for example, you know, like I can't say, you know, we've generated, you know, 12 million in intellectual property in the past five years. It's very difficult to tell me here's the value, but Here's part of the story. When the students start, we ask them about how they feel about the innovation skills. Like what's, what's their self-reported rating of how they rank themselves on, you know, uh, Likert scale of innovation skills. And um, at the end, we also ask them for that rating. And it's kind of interesting because, you know, in some cases, some of the skills progress a lot and it depends which challenge it depends which um, which cohort some cohorts you know sometimes the communication and collaboration go right up other times it's the prototyping because you know they for example in the summer there was much less prototyping because the experience was seven weeks long um, in the fall it will be 13 weeks long so it's very different when you have five extra weeks in terms of what you can do so the improvement on innovation skills does change. Um, but what's even more interesting is the testimonials of the students and how much interest. So how many applicants you have, um, what's your uh, success rate, but also how many, um, how many leaders you get from, uh, from each cohort, how many people want to come back. So that's also a form of metric. The innovation lab is not old enough for me to tell you what's the value inside a university in terms of numbers. But I can tell you when I look at enthusiasm and I look at interest and I look at how this matches a lot of the needs that our students have, but also partners wanting to work with students. And, you know, I can't tell you how many partners have told students, even the undergrads, like, can we hire you now? Um, no, you can't because they have to study full time. But, you know, can I hire you for six months, for example? So when employers want to hire students from the innovation lab, when they want uh, to have interns from the innovation lab, when the students are giving their testimonials and their experiences out of this world and, and they're, you know, after um, their first experience, they're starting to see even more 
what uh, the value is. And, you know, to me, the reactions, like even if they say, you know, like my experience was great in this iteration or here's some feedback, here's some criticism. Um, the students are generally super happy about the innovation lab. Their, their, their reactions are fantastic. I would say that, you know, at least 95% of the students fill up the anonymous feedback and you know, they could they could be very nasty if they want it <laughs> because it's anonymous. I'm not collecting names or emails, but their their experience is, is generally it's a fantastic experience. It's a very worthwhile experience. But to me, I will know more about that experience a few years down the line when they start telling me things such as, you know, I had an interview and then they asked me, you know, what experience you have with this? And then I, I quoted my experience in the innovation lab. And then they asked me so many questions about it. And I feel as though I was equipped for my interview. I got this job because I did this. Um, so when we start to see post facto, a few years down the line, the success of the students that go through the innovation lab, I'll be able to answer this question much more. Meanwhile, I'm developing series of metrics and I'm consulting with circles of innovators to see how we can also measure the intangibles. Uh, so the easiest way to measure innovation is usually return on investment, um, but it's also in universities the hardest way to measure uh, the success of innovation because we're usually not uh, commercializing everything. There are uh, incubators and we do have District 3 who does that, but it's very difficult uh, otherwise. You, you talked about innovation skills. What are innovation skills? So the traditional um, 21st century skills, we also like to call them innovation skills, um, are the traditional five that I've named before. So uh, strategic thinking, critical thinking, creativity, communication, and collaboration. And in the innovation lab, we, we target innovation skills plus. So I like to call them innovation skills plus, and I add the three that I talked about. So prototyping, networking, and leadership. Okay, and when you talked about how students are reacting and that they were happy and they were excited about their, their experience and that was anonymous, but what were the, like, what made them happy? In their experiences, what was really the highlight of their experience? What really touched them or, you know? Let me read a couple of things. Yeah, go okay. ahead. So one student says, this challenge has been a lot of fun along the way. I have learned some valuable skills and met some great people. The workshops combined with self-driven exploration of the challenges themselves and the outstanding mentorship have really provided a grounding and design and innovation, both theory and practice that regular classroom and lectures miss. Um, the innovation lab was truly amazing with my colleagues. Thanks to them, I was able to find the true meaning behind the term teamwork and collaboration. Also, it was a time that I could enhance my leadership and improve my interpersonal skills. Last but not least, this challenge allowed me to broaden the way I view the world. I would love to participate in it again if there is more opportunity. Um, so another one said, you know, I learned a lot of new design approaches and as an inspiring entrepreneur, I might apply the same approaches for my future projects that involve solving social issues like the ones that we are experiencing right now. So, you know, the, those are their general reactions and you know, I, I could read, you know, probably 40 of them and it would look similar. Um, but one which, uh, which really marked me uh, profoundly, you know, one student said, I remember Alberto and Omar had to explain a lot of the more scientific things to me, especially with the results and everything. I hoped it helped in the making of the presentation because you have to pass it to my brain to make sure I got it before. For me, it was really helpful and they were very open and explained things quite well. So this is a the student in uh, English literature who was also in fashion design who said, you know, I didn't understand the stats at all, but it also helped the quality of the presentation because they, they had to explain it to me first and then, you know, we, we, we move on to, uh, to the next stage. So the students in general love learning from each other. They, they really want to take risks, you know, like, when you live for you, you leave and you go to university, you want to change the world. Like you're 18 years old, you know, you think, ah, oh, there are all these problems in the world. Like I am, I am going to change the world. I'm going to do all these things. And you get to university and you're like, okay, 
how am I changing the world, right? And then you take a course and you're like, oh, I have to memorize this stuff <laughs> you know, or I have to write this assignment. And then when does it come the time that I can change the world? And, and you know, they get that experience. They get that change the world experience because they propose solutions to problems that don't have solutions, don't have ready-made solutions. So we give them that, that opportunity to, to really have an impact and they, they learn processes, they meet people, they learn how to work between disciplines. They get some framing. They get mentorship, and uh, and and they truly appreciate that experience. You know, in the first uh, a couple of, of of comments, you feel that they're comparing the experience that they're going through um, to their traditional experience in their classroom. So we talked a lot about how students are being transformed to your, through your innovation lab. But how is teaching at, at Concordia could be also affected or influenced or by the experiences that your students, like, you know, uh, students who are going through the, the innovation lab are experiencing. And so how can be, you know, like this experience be spread or, um, yeah, amongst, you well, know, uh, against, <laughs> you're, you're asking me a question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you if you think of, I mean, if I just start with myself, um, the innovation lab is what I needed as a teaching challenge. I tried to change my pedagogy many times. It felt as though very often students were waiting for a recipe and they were insulted if I was not giving them necessarily what they were expecting. Um, you know, I remember in my first year of teaching or second year of teaching, uh, I was teaching through getting students to create seminars. It was a master's degree course, so you know you could call it a seminar, and you can get students to really be dynamic. And I was mentoring students through the creation of their um, uh, the development of their seminars, so that you know it could be they, they really understood the topic, they could really create some activities. And you know, there's a saying that says, you know, like you, it's kind of traditional, but you know, you remember five percent of what you hear, but you remember ninety five percent of what you teach. So I was teaching through teaching and giving feedback and I thought you know this is a great experience and I think that most students have enjoyed it but you know some there's a portion of the students who told me you know why are we paying professors for it? they're not teaching so I got that in my final evaluation and I thought it's because you haven't recognized my competency to facilitate that you think that I'm not teaching but I'm teaching a lot more than I should like it's easier for me to prepare a course and to narrate what I need to narrate so that you can just sit there, take the notes and then write an assignment that is going to emulate what I said. So this way I'm gonna think you're really bright because you're able to write something similar to what I said. That's basically, that's the formula. And then, you know, I tried a lot of things. I tried teaching through, you know, round tables, teaching through, uh, you know, topics in various, uh, carousels, uh, problem-based learning, uh, you know, all sorts of approaches to learning. And, and every time that I personally tried that in credited courses, because I was in some cases alone doing it, because it was new, students were not expecting it. There is, um, there is a portion of the students that really appreciate it, but there's also a portion of students that were quite antagonistic uh, with regards to the experience. And, and I think, you know, it's a lot of work to innovate. And if I'm going to do it, I want to do it for real. And I don't want to do it just for a drill. So to me, the Innovation Lab, for my own teaching, it was a golden opportunity to experience how I could explore um, teaching transformation or new approaches to teaching and learning. Um, I would say that a lot of people are open. At this point, there is a bit of tiredness in the system. People are exhausted for a variety of reasons. We just, you know, we're returning after 18 months away. Um, there's a lot of, uh, in French, I would say, people are out of breath. Uh, there's a lot to do, a lot more to do. There's a lot of changes. Um, I suspect that in the next few years, higher education is going to change radically. And, and you know, not only in how it manages itself internally, but also because of student expectations. Um, market demands disruption is across you know across the street it's it's not we've been disrupted by COVID-19 but we will be disrupted again and it's going to come in a lot of waves 
So I think that there's a lot of openness to that, but there has to be some kind of flexibility inside the system so that professors can try things out. And maybe, you know, teaching will not be uh, radically transformed in every course, but there is an opening in a variety of programs that are much more forward thinking. The world is changing gradually. And I think, you know, there's a lot of movement towards that. I'm very optimistic when it comes to the future of higher education. Um, there's a song that says, you know, it's the end of the world as we know it. And I think it's, it's probably the end of higher education as we know it. Um, but it's not the end of higher education at all. It's the beginning of a flourishing area where students will come to higher education to become much more skilled for the future of work. They're going to be, become prepared to enter the fourth industrial revolution. Um, they're going to be more confident innovators and they're going to be able to push forward. Uh, the more partners we can get on board to work with us, the more relevant we will be. I just took a quote that I will be using for my sharing on social media when I share your <laughs> this interview with you. I wrote it down, so now <laughs> I'm ready for my sharing. <laughs> okay, so Eloise, going to social media, uh, since we're talking about social media, uh, you mentioned even now um, systemic design, and you also had, uh, you mentioned that in a recent LinkedIn post, uh, as um, the systemic design as the innovation lab's team favorite framework. So what is systemic design? So let me just go to my slide here and I'll be able to share this with you. Okay, so let me put this bigger so that you can see it. So we've adopted, um, so for a while we were using design thinking and what design thinking is basically a uh, a user-centered uh, approach to um, coming up with some solutions. And design thinking has been uh, ongoing. I mean, it's, it's, it's not new. It, uh, it uh, came to, um, to life in the 1970s and it's been you know, used widely in a lot of contexts. And a lot of people like it because you have to think of the user first and, and you know, start empathizing with your audience. You know, when you think about, you know, in, 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 the, in the, the, the online post that I put, you know, those, those packagings that you, you buy something like, I don't know, scissors. <laughs> I remember at one point I moved and I bought some scissors and they were in this really stiff plastic package that if you try to open it with a knife, you're going to hurt yourself. Like it's seam, seamless plastics. Somebody doesn't want you to get those scissors before you buy them and before you buy a pair of scissors that is not wrapped so that you can actually open it. But I don't know how many times I cut myself with these packagings and they're like unrealistic packages. Um, nobody has ever looked at a user trying to open this up. Like it's, it's not possible. So design thinking avoids those kinds of things, right? They look at, you look at the user and the experience. And one of the things that we, we realized in the innovation lab is that it didn't take into consideration um, the environment and a lot of other uh, um, aspects of innovation. And also um, it, wasn't, it wasn't very agile. I mean, you can do it very quickly, but you're not really going to it thoroughly. So if you do, for example, design thinking in two weeks, you're never going to be able to do the whole process properly. You're sort of like learning about it, but you're not learning through it, which is what you should be doing. So what we did is we turned to the systemic design approach, which has been developed by the British Council uh, in the UK. Um, so the systemic uh, design approach works. It, it's also called the double diamond um, uh, model. Um, so we're, we're looking at, you know, let's set an orientation and a vision. When we do that, we, we have time to explore, we have time to reframe, and when we have time to build uh, relationships and connections and start telling the story of uh, the problem, the product. And then we start creating prototypes. So that's very similar. It's parallel to design thinking, but at the same time, um, it allows a variety of, um, of, of paying attention to a variety of other aspects. So when you, you create, you also create thinking of your relationships and thinking of uh, the story at the same time. And then there's this catalyzing, which is probably a word that I'd like to, you know, say like maybe pushing forward or, you know, trying things out uh, as, as part of this design thinking, um, there's the systemic design approach. 
So I'm just going to show you another slide about the kinds of uh, focus that we can uh, look at when we're using uh, the systemic design thinking. Are you seeing my whole slide here? So we have, um, there's a variety of uh, design focus that we can look at. So people and planet centered, but it also allows us to zoom in and zoom out. So let's look at the particulars of a problem, but then also let's look at, you know, the broader impact of the problem. Um, we can also focus on testing and growing ideas. So let's try something small and let's start building it. This is also present in design thinking when you start looking at iterations, but this one allows us, uh, it gives us a bit more flexibility when we want to do things very rapidly. So if you try one idea, let's say today, and, and you know, you can test it with a variety of people, can we be a bit more agile and trying to develop it? There's also the collaboration and connection, which we can focus on. So maybe in some cases, we absolutely need to have uh, to expand our network. So let's focus on that. Uh, then there's like inclusive and welcoming uh, of a variety of differences. So it's in some cases, it's important that we look at the variety of people or the variety of contexts in which we need to focus. And then also um, sometimes it could be, you know, just that it needs to be circular and regenerative. So depending on where the students want to focus on, um, they, they, can, they can look at these specific areas what I like is that we're not dividing in, in the first focus, we're not dividing the people and the planet. We're really thinking about those two things together. Um, then we look at what type of design activities. So there's exploration, um, then the reframing, uh, then the creation, and then the catalyzing. So usually catalyzing is about pushing ideas. So, um, so how do you push an idea to get it tested? And, and then the, uh, in that particular uh, model, the systemic design model, you're also looking at a variety of roles for designers um, when they tackle systemic issues. So some people are more systemic thinkers. Um, the other people are leaders and storytellers. They like to narrate, tell the stories of a user. Others are designers and makers. Others are connectors and conveners. So they like to initiate larger projects. So we can give a variety of roles to students. And also in some challenges, you know, like for example, in the face mask challenge, we needed designers and makers, but we also needed um, storytellers. This is not the same thing as for example, um, the data H uh, challenge with data H challenge is not the same thing as, so we can, we can play within the roles. We can give a bit more metaphors for students to come by and then, you know, they can start thinking about the enabling activities that are part of the double diamond um, um, model or framework of systemic design. So that's pretty much what there is to say here. Great. And you talked about, um, and I'm going to stop after this question because I, I know I, I went over my time with you, but <laughs> you talked about people and planet at the heart of what you're doing. And you mentioned it when you were presenting also. So can you go more into like elaborate on how the human being and the planet is at the heart of the innovation that you do in the innovation lab? When I came to Concordia in 2008, I met with the founder of our program. His name was Gary Boyd, uh, one of the founders of our program when the program was created in 1968. So I'm talking about the educational technology program. Uh, he passed away in 2010 or 2011, but he left some interesting legacies. One of the articles uh, that I like my students to read all the time when I teach instructional design, and I still carry those kinds of thinking inside the innovation lab, is called Designing Cyber Systematically for Some Viability. And, you know, it's a very complex article. He uses a lot of physics and philosophical words, and the students usually complain, and they're like, why are you asking me to read this? And, and really, there's one idea that's important in, in this, and it's that we need to be some viable. If we're going to design things without thinking of our planet and without thinking of the fact that we have to live on this planet for a very long time together, we're going to have an issue. And, and I think that this needs to be at the forefront of our language around innovation. There is no innovation if we improve something that actually harms our planet or harms human beings. 
it's 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 counterproductive so you know for example if if you're going to decide to improve something you know lately i saw that you know um, there's a company that created a cardboard uh, bread um, you know the attachments that you put on uh, uh, bread bags they're in plastic why are they in plastics like what for why can't they be in cardboard they do the same thing, right? Most people throw them away when we get home. And then, you know, there's all sorts of ways to package the bread, turn the turn the bags so that you prevent the bread from the bread from drying. But why does this have to be? So the question is, you know, like can we get pollution? Can we get the use of single-use plastic? And and you know, you can use cardboard that is biodegradable and you know it's it's not a problem. So if you start thinking about improvements anything that you will improve that is actually being mindful of, of human beings that need to use your invention or your innovation, but also does it improve the, the planet and what we, what we do? And if, you know, it would be very easy for, you know, if we all start thinking like this and we all adopt this idea that, you know, we're going to like, let's stop. Does this innovation help human beings? Yes. Does it harm the planet? Yes. Like we don't do it. It's as simple as that. So if we start thinking this way, the the um, the approaches to innovation would would really be improved, and also we would have a direct impact to you know whatever else we can still control on the planet.